name is Ashley Dipati. I am a software developer for Esri Professional Services, uh, working with a lot of different commercial customers. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about a project that I implemented for an insurance organization in 2017. For those of you who are do not work in the insurance space, you may be wondering what insurers use GIS for. <clears throat> well, as you can probably obviously realize, almost everything that's insured has a physical location. Um, property locations are obvious. Um, automobiles have both a garaging location and the location where the vehicle is currently located. Um, and even people have a home address, a work address, and a current location. So one of the things that insurers use GIS for um, is understanding the spatial distribution of the things that they have insured. So insurers have analysts who are responsible for analyzing their portfolios, their, the, the policies that they have in their business, um, and understanding if they have too much financial risk and how they can mitigate that risk. So they use GIS to analyze their policy locations, um, and they're looking for things like concentrations of high value policies. Um, <clears throat> for example, if you have written billions and billions of dollars of insurance in like a very small area on the coast of Florida, that would be a risk to your business that you may want to take steps to mitigate. Um, <clears throat> these folks do things in addition to just generally exploring <clears throat> policy locations, they also bring in things like, what is the worst hurricane that has hit the eastern seaboard? Um, what is the worst um, series of tornadoes that we've seen hit the U.S.? And what if, if those things or similar things happen to my business today, what would be the financial impacts of them? This is just one of the ways that insurers use GIS, but this is the workflow that we worked with for this customer, um, and it's the one I'm going to talk to you about today. So this is not a screenshot of the actual application that we built for the customer, but it's something that does something that is very, very similar to what they we built for them. So you can see that we have a map here, and on that map we have a layer that shows policy locations aggregated up to hexagon bins. So you get a surface of your total insured value across, in this case, the United States. Um, <clears throat> and then you also have that, can see that in context of other things. In this case, we're looking at the wind swaths from Hurricane Michael. Um, so this, even just looking at this view, can provide a lot of interesting information to insurers, um, especially if they can zoom in and drill down and look at smaller, more regional areas. But where the application really is useful is being able to run analyses on specific situations. So in this case, with our Hurricane Michael footprint, um, the insurer has, or the analyst has run an analysis on this. And now they have information um, for each of the wind swaths in the hurricane. They can understand what, what policies may be impacted by that. Um, in this case, we can see that there are a little over 6,000 policies inside the most impacted wind band for Hurricane Michael. So <clears throat> you may be asking, to, asking yourself, why is Ashley giving this presentation um, about something that seems relatively straightforward? You have points on a map, um, you're visualizing them in an aggregated manner, and then you're doing a spatial filter, like a point and polygon and summarization on it. Well, there are a lot of reasons that this problem is more complicated than it seems at first sight. I've listed four of the big reasons that this is not a straightforward um, web app builder with some layers kind of application. Um, the first one is that insurance organizations have insurance specific logic. Um, and this is mainly around policies that have multiple locations associated with them. So the summarization results that you get for a two, like a two location policy where one of your locations is inside your impacted area is going to be different than the summarizations that you get back if both of the locations are inside the impacted area. 
Um, <clears throat> another one was, was that for this particular customer, they needed to be able to integrate with an underwriting system. Um, and not for like visualizing the map, but just for getting the raw numbers back that they could use in this automated system. And then the third point, which is honestly, for me, the most challenging point and the part that I've focused most of this presentation on is the fact that we're talking about really large sums of data here. So this customer had um, more than 10 million points that they needed to be able to interact with and visualize on the map um, and run their statistics calculations against it. Um, and the, the platform has advanced a lot in the, in the past years, you know, to make this more possible than it was in 2017. But even today, this is, this is a challenge. And then the last thing um, is that the, the end users of these applications are insurance analysts. They're, they're not GIS analysts. Um, at least the, the point of this application was to make this technology available to people who are not GIS analysts. So it needed to be really straightforward and easy to use. So <clears throat> in, in general, we and services try to start with a configuration first approach. And that's one of the best practices that we recommend to our customers, simply because it makes things easier to maintain, um, it's cheaper to develop, and generally less of a headache all around. So I, I put together what this would look like in a technology only, um, or a COTS only technology stack. So you would have a, a web application, um, I assumed it would be a web app builder application. And that would have layers in it, those map layers that would, that would show all the policy locations um, and also your, your, your um, catastrophe layers. Um, and those policy layers would be exposing policy locations that were located in some kind of data store, either the ArcGIS data store or an enterprise database like Oracle, SQL Server, or Postgres. The, the challenge with this, or the, the ways in which this is going to break down when you have 10 million policy locations, is that your, your map draw performance is going to be not great because you're querying the database and you're, you're pulling all of these 10 million locations back up through your entire stack. Um, and then the second thing is that if you want to do the, the statistics calculations, um, to find the number of policies that are located within your Hurricane Michael footprint, um, that's going to take a while. It's not going to be something that can that can happen very quickly, and you're probably going to get a lot of timeouts um, and generally not easy to use. One approach, if you're okay with limiting your functionality, would be to pre-calculate everything, um, cache your map layers and don't let users do their own um, spatial filters, their own like analyses, um, that, is, that would probably actually really work. Um, but the, the problem is, is that that kind of mitigates the, like that's not the point of this application. Um, the point of the application is to allow users to import their geometries and do their own analyses on it. So when we were designing the solution and figuring out how we were going to um, do all the things that the customer wanted us to do, and um, we were getting ready to prepare our design for the customer, we kind of came up with these three main goals that we were trying to work towards. And the one on the left is COTS. So we wanted to keep everything not, not custom, um, but using off-the-shelf components um, because that's easy to maintain and low cost to develop. We also wanted, we knew that performance was going to be a challenge and a, a bit an important thing for their users. Um, so this included both map draw time um, <clears throat> as long as, as well as the long running statistics calculations. And then the last leg of course is capability. So this included dynamic filters 
um, the ability to do the non-standard financial calculations and the system integration touch points. So of course, there's a red X in the middle here, and that's supposed to mean that you can't actually achieve all three of those together. You have to make compromises for all of them. So this is what our technology stack looked like in 2017 when we implemented this for this customer. Um, we had a web app builder application with a custom widget that has a custom layer implementation <clears throat> in it. And I'll come back to that after I've talked to you through the rest of this, the rest of this diagram. So the, the, the custom widget in the web app builder application communicated with a Python based web service um, that exposed a RESTful interface. And um, this allowed also the external systems to make similar requests to get the statistics calculations back um, for the analyses. These web services um, communicated and, and started off a geoprocessing job, uh, which we used mainly for the ability to have asynchronous jobs um, that could they could take a while to run. These geoprocessing services essentially were wrappers for executing a series of stored procedures in our enterprise database. So we all of the all of the complicated um, work to do the statistics calculations and all of the work to generate hexagon grid a hexagon grid um, all 20 layers of a hexagon grid was all done in the database level and the reason for that is that um, we wanted to keep the the calculations as close to the data as possible so we don't have to be querying that data and moving that across multiple layers um, because that's a recipe for disaster so we have these complex stored procedures that are in the database um, every time an analysis comes in from the application um, the stored procedures will write all of these hexagon values and all of the values for the policy, the, the polygons to some tables in the database. Those are all exposed through a giant map layer, um, which has the results of all of the analyses in it. And then um, making the circle back to the custom layer in Web App Builder, the custom layer in Web App Builder basically applies a filter down to the analysis level so that the application will only display the hexagon grids and the portfolio or the, the policy results for the analysis that we selected. This actually works really pretty well. Um, there's a lot of custom parts to it. There's a lot of pieces moving around in like different places you need to troubleshoot when things don't go well, but it's performant enough. It's functional. Um, it's being widely used by the customer that we developed this for. Um, and it's, you know, it's a pretty good solution. But I also wanted to talk about more recent work that we've done in this space um, to take advantage of some newer technologies um, that have been, that are available nowadays. Um, we wanted, to, when we took another turn at reimagining the solution. Um, we wanted to make sure, we wanted to keep everything a little bit closer to COTS and cut out like some of these super custom pieces that we had um, that made it challenging to implement and challenging to troubleshoot. So we came up with a slimmed down and, and simplified technology stack um, this you know, 2019-2020. So in this version of a very, very similar workflow, um, we still have a web app builder with a custom widget in it, but in this application, we're displaying standard layers. And once again, I'll, I'll come back to the standard layers um, as we loop through this diagram. Um, so we have our ArcGIS server with our, with a, with a, again, a Python geoprocessing service, because that is a very convenient way to wrap asynchronous long-running tasks. Um, but in this case, the Python geoprocessing service is kicking off a job in what we call the accumulation engine, 
um, which is really an implementation of the Big Data Toolkit. The, the Big Data Toolkit is a, um, a soft product available through Esri Professional Services. To, to be honest, I don't 100% understand what the Big Data Toolkit is, but it, 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 it does calculations on really big data sets. So we have the geoprocessing service, which kicks off the Spark jobs in the accumulation engine. Um, those jobs take several minutes to complete, um, very similar to how it, the, the timing of the 2017 application. Um, but then instead of writing all of those results out to a regular enterprise data store, um, it's writing them into the spatiotemporal big data store which is really nice because um, the spatiotemporal big data store, you can write, you can have map layers for that. And those map layers are supported across the platform without needing to write any custom client side code to display them. So that's how we're able to have standard layers in our Web App Builder widget. Essentially, the, we took a very similar approach to where um, we're keeping all the calculations close to the data. We're just, instead of writing stored procedures and using traditional database methods, which are still kind of slow, we're you know, taking all of these calculations and taking advantage of big data technology to calculate those and serve those up in a way that's consistent with the rest of the platform. And this also has the advantage of making the layers that we're showing in this custom application available in other parts of the platform that don't need to be custom, like Pro or an operations dashboard. So we have a lot of ideas where we can take this next. I'm going to end the presentation on this screenshot of the application. Now that you understand a little bit about what went into it and the challenges that we faced with creating it, I hope that you all have a great day. Thank you.